Well, good evening, church family. This is your pastor, and obviously I'm not calling. I'm... Wait, wait a minute. Speaking of calling. Oh, sorry. Oh. Hey, baby. Yes. Now, listen. I'm... Uh, uh, yes. No, I understand supper. Yes, I I know we're having leftovers. I'm I'm actually good with left. Yes, I'm good with left. I know, and we're having corn, green beans. Okay, I'm good. And yes, I've uh, actually I'm I've been working on the snack that you packed me, and I so appreciate it. It's not Doritos, uh, but mmm, I sure appreciate these delicious grapes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I got to go, baby. I'm in the middle of something important, okay? All right. Love you, too. Bye-bye. Sorry about that. When the first lady calls, you always answer that phone. But as you can see, Miss Leanne is in the process of reprioritizing my life in terms of what we eat and how we're conserving uh, food and, well, how I'm learning to eat some things that I don't normally eat. But while we're on the subject of reprioritization, I believe that during this pandemic, as we know, uh, this coronavirus that's spread throughout our community and throughout the entire our world, I believe that God is doing some positive things, and one of those things is the reprioritization, uh, reprioritization, if you will, of America and really the world in terms of where are our priorities. And as I preach Sunday, God wants to be first in that. So I'm praying, and my prayer is for you that you've taken this time to reprioritize your life. And the Bible says in Matthew 6, Seek me first, and my righteousness, my kingdom's rule in your life, and all these things will be added unto you. So that's my prayer. If you need to know or you want some help in reprioritization of your life, then why don't you call the church office? Even tonight as you watch this, there's somebody waiting uh, that will help you. Uh, call 615-384-3393. And somebody is on the other end of that number that will help you in uh, accepting the gospel, maybe church membership. Maybe there's uh, something God's already laid on your heart in terms of priority and uh, repriority, and we'll work that out even tonight. But I'm glad you tuned in tonight. Uh, I want to spend just a few minutes discussing what Sunday from Sunday, this Sunday, March 29th, looks like for the next few weeks as we just weather the storm of this pandemic and have to do things just a little bit differently. So listen carefully because Sunday I'm excited to announce to you we're going to have Sunday school. Oh, somebody I'll just give a honk praise right there. We're going to have Sunday school on Sunday. Now, obviously, it's going to look a little different. We're not going to gather at the building. We're going to gather in our living rooms or bedrooms or, or a kitchen or uh, preferably the kitchen or the living room over the bedroom. But either, either way, we're going to have uh, Sunday school. So listen how Sunday schedule is going to go, okay? At 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, uh, Miss Sarah Davison is going to have a children's message, and this is going to be for your little ones all the way up through fifth grade. And uh, she's going to bring just a traditional Bible story. And parents, we want you to tune in with your children at eight o'clock, and I'll tell you how you can tune in in just a minute. But so at eight o'clock, children's uh, message from Miss Sarah Davison. We're going to have middle school Sunday school. Brother Michael will be leading that Sunday school class, and it will also be at eight o'clock. We'll have high school Sunday school that will begin at 845 on Sunday morning. So this coming Sunday, this is Sunday school schedule. College and career will meet at uh, 8 o'clock as well, okay, as well as young adults and meeting adults, all at 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, with that being said, um, I will, uh, as far as young adults, I'm going to teach that class, and y'all forgive me, I'm looking at my notes here, but I'm going to teach the young adult, it's going to be division-wide, and uh, meeting adult will be division-wide, and Dr. Parker uh, will teach meeting adults. Now, uh, 
in order to do this, we're going to do it interactive, okay? It won't be Facebook Live or YouTube Live. That's going to be Brother Bob's class. I'll talk about that in just a second. But for all of these classes, they'll be virtual and interactive. We're going to use a program called Zoom. But uh, you don't have to do anything special exactly uh, and, and, and the exact manner to which we do this is going to be through text messaging. We're going to text you through the GBC text. So it's very important if you're watching this and you don't receive text message, I need you to do that. As a matter of fact, I want to show you how to do that real quick so that you know. Basically, on your uh, text messaging, however, I've got a droid and many of you are un, you know, not so privileged and you have an iPhone, but either way, if you'll go to your text messaging and send a message to 22300. Again, that's 22300. And if you'll just type the word alert in that and send it on, then you'll be signed up for our text messaging. Now, it's very important that uh, uh, that you're in our system. So if you're not receiving voicemails, you need to call the office first thing in the morning and say, I need to get in on the, uh, on the church voicemail system. That way you can sign up for text messaging. Uh, that's how you'll be notified of your Sunday school class. And really, every virtual opportunity we have will come via text message. That's how key it is. If you have any questions on that, please, in the morning, call the church office. And we'll be happy to navigate uh, anything that you need on that. Senior adults, you'll be Facebook Live and YouTube Live. That's why we have sent out messages asking you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now, let me show you how easy that is, okay? Uh, basically, if you'll just go to the website, gbcspringfield.org, you'll see a big red button right over here that says, um, well, it's just got the word subscribe. It talks about how our sermons, and that's where all our sermons are loaded. So if you'll just hit the word subscribe, it'll take you to the YouTube channel for Grace Baptist Church. And then you just simply go right here and hit subscribe. Now, I can't do that. I'm already a subscriber, uh, but you can. And just click right there, and it's that simple. We need you to subscribe because we have to have a 1,000 subscribers in order to make YouTube live as well uh, in conjunction with our Facebook live. And we want to do that for our senior adults because many have smart TVs, and they can watch our service on their TV rather than a cell phone or computer. So if you haven't done that, please do that. So all of this is Sunday school. Again, children at 8, middle school at 8, high school 845, college, career, young adults and median adults all at 8 o'clock. Then at 10 o'clock, we'll gather once again and uh, for drive-in church. What an incredible opportunity it was. Listen, we had uh, over 200 cars in the parking lot on Sunday, and we had more than 6,000 watching online. Uh, subsequently, we've had almost 15,000 view it even after the fact. So the gospel is being sown in Robertson County and beyond. So thank you for participating in that. And and if you weren't there, I want to invite you to come this Sunday. It was so fun. And it was such an incredible experience. And the Lord moved. We even had a decision on Sunday as a result of drive-in church. So come on. It's completely safe. Uh, you can keep your windows up uh, this Sunday. We hope to have our FM transmitter where you can just dial in to a radio station. We have the transmitter. We just uh, are getting all the kinks worked out of it. So we're so excited about that. And and uh, that, that'll make us absolutely weatherproof with the FM transmitter. So we're grateful for that. So 10 o'clock a.m., invite somebody to park alongside of you and come and experience what only God can do in your life through drive-in church. And um, with that, I'm excited for you to know that God has provided a way for us to continue not only church, but with our plan for Sunday. And that is our property expansion plan, PEP, P-E-P, and our one-day offering. You know that next Monday, just a few days from now, we're going to close on that piece of property that you voted on and that you said, yes, we want to participate uh, not only uh, in, in being able to vote for the property, but also being able to pay for it. Thank you for your faithfulness, many of you. 
a whole lot of you have already given your pep. You gave it just a little bit early, and we appreciate that. Thank you for being so faithful in your tithes and offerings. Uh, some have dropped it by here. Some have done it by text message, and that's the easiest way. And then uh, some have gone online. But thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving in these times. I, as I told you in our last address, uh, even Leanne and I know these are perilous times and these are scary times in terms of uh, economics and what have you. But the Lord is on the throne and we're just going to trust him and we're going to remain faithful to him. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Hey, let's take just a minute and talk about Wednesday nights. Um, Wednesday night, starting next Wednesday, April 1st, here's what it's going to look like, all right? Brother Michael's going to do a children's time with our K-5 through graders. That's going to be at 6 o'clock p.m. You'll be able to find that on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Okay, uh, it's just going to be an awesome time. You'll be able to uh, to grab hold of that. So that's again at six o'clock next uh, Wednesday. Moms, dads, uh, we want you to tune in with your children for that time. Uh, as Brother Michael just does a traditional Bible story and just well, we're just laying the basics and uh, keeping our children K through fifth grade engaged in the Word of God. Then Brother Michael will do a Facebook Live and a YouTube Live of middle school and high school worship. Uh, Abby and Sarah will be leading worship in that. Brother Michael will be preaching and uh, we want you to tune in. We want your 6th through 12th graders to tune in to that and uh, just engage in the Word of God with, our, with Brother Michael, our youth minister, and what an incredible job he is doing uh, in the area of youth. So uh, be faithful in that. Tune in. Middle school and high school are 6 o'clock next Wednesday night. Our uh, GBC student ministry page is where that will be posted, the Facebook Live portion. And again, you'll be able to watch it on YouTube Live as well. The Well College and Career Ministry, Brother Johnny will be preaching on uh, on that page as well. Uh, the Well Worship, it'll be Facebook Live, also YouTube Live at 6.45 next Wednesday night. So we got something for children at 6, middle school and high school at 6, and then college and career at 6.45. Now I know what you're saying. Well, what about the adults? What are we going to do? Well, we're going to have two Grace University classes. These are going to be virtual and interactive, much like our Sunday school. And I, along with Dr. Parker, are going to teach these classes. Dr. Parker is going to host a Daniel class. So going through the book of Daniel, which is a completely appropriate at this time, as it speaks to even the times that we're living in. That will begin at 645, and we will send you a link via text message for you to participate in that. Or, I'm going to be teaching an end times class. Many of you have participated in my end times class before, and I think it's just fitting and proper. What an appropriate time to walk through what the world is going to look like in the future and what I believe the very near future. So that'll be at 645 and we'll send you a link by a text message that you can get on that virtual uh, interactive class uh, that I'll teach. End times, Dr. Parker will teach Daniel. Both of those will be at 645. I'm so excited about uh, the opportunities that the Lord has given us through technology to be able to... Uh, well, continue to have church, okay, uh, when we can't gather socially, uh, except for our drive-in uh, church on Sunday. We need to be praying, and I want to encourage you that uh, as we walk through the next few days and few weeks, we're going to submit to our governing authorities and whatever they roll out for us, that's what we want to do. Uh, complying with mandates and complying with uh, every chance and every way we can to combat this virus. I want you, especially senior adults, but hey, listen, if you, I don't care how old you are, if you don't have to be out beyond your yard or beyond uh, mowing your yard and just working outside, praise the Lord, springtime's coming, so even if we're quarantined at home, we can still get outside, but if you don't have to go beyond that, I don't want you to. I want you to stay at home, and let's do all our part in flattening the curve and eradicating this virus. Continue to pray for your president. 
Continue to pray for all your government leaders. Continue to pray for our local leaders here as they make the best decisions under the wisdom of God. We're going to continue to do everything that we can uh, to perpetuate the gospel and to minister to you. Thank you for taking those meals, by the way. And uh, we want to continue to deliver that, uh, uh, those meals from Larry's to you. We've expanded to the community, and it's given us a great opportunity for the gospel. So continue to uh, pray for us. If we can serve you in any way, you let us know. Now, for the rest of your uh, uh, Wednesday night discipleship, in just a few minutes, um, when, when I get done uh, speaking, uh, we're going to roll back and do just a, uh, well, we'll just call it a flashback, if you will. We have uh, went back in the archive and found some old sermons, and we want to share that with you. Some of you will recognize uh, this is at Grace Baptist Church in the same building that we meet in, but it looks quite different uh, than it does now. So it's just kind of a flash from the past. And uh, not only does the building look a little different, well, I've noticed that your pastor does too. I, I once had a little bit of hair, and uh, well, I was a little bit skinnier too. So uh, see if you recognize some of the folks in that uh, video and just let it just take you back to yesteryear and just understand how timely God's Word is even now. I love you, church family, and appreciate all that you're doing. If you need us for anything, you call.
thank you for the promise of 10,000 years. And for us, you are holy. Because that's all we're going to be in this world. Lord, be with those who need to go through cancer today. Lord, just soften our hearts and prepare our hearts so that you have a safe place for them. Lord, we love you and we give you all the glory and honor and praise. And it's in your son Jesus' most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Might as well give the Lord a clap praise on your way down. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Mm. He is worthy to be praised. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn with me to the book of Exodus. We're going to look at chapter 2 of the book of Exodus and verses 11 through 15 as we continue on in our sermon series. We're traveling and journeying through the book of Exodus ever so fastly at this fast pace. We're already at chapter 2 and uh, well we just started at the beginning of the year. So we're doing pretty well. A chapter a month would be the average of where we are. So we we, we've got a while to go. Amen. Y'all not as excited about that, but that's okay. We'll get there. Exodus chapter 2, and, and we're traveling through this book, one of the greatest books of faith that I believe uh, is in all of the Bible. Moses, its primary author, one of the greatest leaders who led and lived by faith. And we are learning how to journey and, and how to live on this journey with Jesus by faith. Ladies and gentlemen, our lives are lived out by faith. You've heard me say this, and you're going to hear me say this for 38 more chapters. Amen? That our lives are all about faith. Faith is the foundation. The Bible says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's, that's the biblical definition in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. The Freeman translation of that is believing in something that we cannot see with absolute assurance that it's real. Absolute assurance and conviction that it's, that, that it's real. And ladies and gentlemen, that is, that is our lives and that is the foundation of our lives. God has given, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 3, He's given each one of us a measure of faith, just a, a, a small amount of the ability to believe in something that we cannot see but so that we will make Him the object of of our belief. We've never seen God, but we can believe by the faith that He's given to us that God is real and that God is the master of the universe and that God desires to be the master of our lives. We can believe by faith in the book that He's given to us, the instruction manual, and what it reveals about God that He loves you and He wants a personal relationship with you. We can believe by faith. Having never seen Jesus, we can believe by faith and begin this whole journey and lay the foundation in this whole journey of our lives by, by trusting what the Bible says about Jesus. That Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, y'all going to get me fired up this morning. I'm just telling you. Jesus Christ died according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes great faith to believe that. The ability to believe in something that we cannot see. I believe in Jesus Christ. Come on, you don't get anything else today. I hope you do. i got a lot more to preach. But if you don't get anything else, understand that you can believe in Jesus. And He'll change your life as a result of your belief, as a result of your faith. The Bible says that He'll save you if you believe that. As many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. We can be a child of God by placing our faith in Jesus whom we've never seen yet. Doesn't that sound good, church? Oh, we ought to just go to invitation. We won't, but I mean we ought to because that's, that's the message. You know, somebody said the other day, they said, Brother Steve, you ain't got but one message. <laughs> Jesus saves. Amen. <laughs> What else do I got? What else is there? We begin this whole foundation and this whole journey by faith and placing our faith and trust in Jesus. And then, and, and then that lifelong journey, that, that earthly lifelong journey is lived out by faith every day. Believing every day that God knows, come on, y'all not going to like this part, but believing every day that God knows what's best for our life. 
He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what's about to come in and through your life. And he knows the best way to, to help you navigate through it if you'll gravitate to that, to that understanding by faith and let him be the boss and the authority of our lives. And see, that's where the tough part comes in. Living this life out by faith. Allowing God. You know, when we give our lives to Jesus, what we were, what, what we were doing is, is exchanging everything that he did on the cross. We're exchanging our life for the life that he laid down. And, and we come in, in, uh, into the authority and under the authority of God. And basically what we do when we give our life over to Jesus, when, when we do what Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, we confess that Jesus is Lord. We confess that Jesus is the boss. And we believe everything that the Bible says. The Bible says that we, when we do that, then we're saved. And when we do that, we're relinquishing the rights to our life. And we're allowing God to truly be the boss. We don't like bosses. Come on, I mean, we don't... We got, there's always in our lives, and we deal with this, don't we? We've, you know, we've got bosses everywhere, and some are good, and, and some aren't. The staff's not saying anything. But you know, I mean, some are good, and, and just, but I mean, we don't like having, we don't like people to be in authority over us, do we? We don't want anybody. And when we're talking about giving up the rights to our life, do you do, do we realize today that when we give our lives to Jesus that we no longer live in the mindset of a democracy? When we give our lives to Jesus, we're under a dictatorship, and he is the dictator. He is dictating every faction and facet of our lives. Now, some of you may be here, and you may have never been saved. There's probably several in this congregation and, and in the next that you've never really given uh, Jesus, your life, you've never really given Jesus a try, and you're thinking, man, this dictator thing, and all these rules, and, and what are you talking about, preacher? How I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Isn't that what we say sometimes? You know, that's why a lot of people uh, hear the gospel, but yet don't give their lives because of really what it cost us. It cost us giving up our rights, and they're thinking, man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to give, I don't want somebody else telling me what to do. I don't want God telling me what to do. But in all reality, don't you? I mean, let's think about it. We say with our mind, come on, y'all walk with me. It's just my introduction. It's going to be a long one today, I just tell you. I hope y'all brought lunch. If not, we put a drink machine in the fellowship hall. Get filled up on Mountain Dew. Amen? Now, here's the deal. In our mind, we say, boy, we sure don't like authority. We don't want nobody telling us what to do. I was thinking about this on my way to work today. My way to church this morning as I was traveling. Do y'all know that I don't like speed limits? You know, I was thinking this morning, my life would be a whole lot better if there was no speed limits and I could drive uh, as fast as I wanted to drive wherever I wanted to drive. And it would be a whole lot better if there wasn't those cars sitting in the place that got them lights on the top. You know those troopers? Yeah, I never understood why their car was the color, why Tennessee State Troopers are the car. But do you know they blend right into the scenery in wintertime? You can't even see them until you've already passed them. Oh, it's just amazing. So I was thinking about that this morning. <laughs> My wife is worried. I did not get a ticket, honey, don't worry. <laughs> but I should have. I'm just going to tell you. But, I, you know, I was traveling, I was thinking, boy, I sure wish there wasn't no rules on speed limits. But, but that's what my mind is saying. Y'all following me here? But really, when it gets down to it, what our mind says and what our heart believes is really two different things. Because in my mind, I'm saying, boy, I wish there wasn't no speed limits. But in my heart, aren't you thankful that there's rules and there's laws that we have to follow? And aren't you thankful for the men and women who lay down their lives to hold us accountable to the, to the laws and the rules that are established? I'm so thankful because if not, this world that we live in, it's already bad enough, but it'd be absolute pandemonium. 
Could you imagine if, if nobody had to drive a certain speed limit? Oh, we'd just be out there, and, and we, we'd be a prisoner in our own home. We wouldn't even want to get up because it'd just be dangerous everywhere we went. See, the point I'm trying to make is our mind says we don't really want authority over us, but our heart knows that we have to have it. Come on, y'all ought to write that down. Our mind says we don't want authority, but our heart knows that we have to have it. And God knows that we have to have it. We've got to have some boundaries. In all reality, you may be here to, and, and thinking in your mind, boy, I don't, if I give my life to Jesus, I, I don't, that preacher said I don't have any more rights. I got some boundaries and all these things that, that, that are laid out there before me, and praise God that we do. And folks, I want you to understand, you know, here, here's the deal. Do you realize this morning that most of the people sitting in this place, whether you've been saved or not, it, whether you're a Christian or whether you've never given your lives, we never experience the, the fulfillment of the joy and the peace and all that comes in the promise of John chapter 10, verse 10, when Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And the reason, the reason why we don't is because we never submit ourselves to the authority of God and we never experience when God... God is the boss and we no longer have to make the decisions. We never, we never experience the blessing of having the master of the universe lead us through every facet and everything that we need to do and, and everywhere we need to go in our lives. It's so much easier when somebody else is the boss, especially when he's God. Because God, I'll let you in on a little secret, he's smart. He knows everything. And he knows, listen, he knows better how to run your life than you do. We've got to submit, and we've got to learn how to submit to the authority of God's, of God's power and His will and His way in our life. If not, we will make a total mess of things. Y'all not listening to me this morning. If we try to do it on our own, come on, y'all not listening. If we try to do it on our own, we try to do it in our own will, in our own way, and if we try to do it in our own power, we're going to booger it up. Booger. That's Hebrew. I'm going to use that in all day. I liked it. We will booger it up. Just like Moses. Listen, Moses, one of the greatest examples of faith throughout this book, but it didn't start that way. He messed it all up in the very beginning. And that's what I want us to look at and talk about today. As we look at this passage of Scripture this morning, I'm going to give you three results of failure, of us failing to submit to the authority of God in our lives. So if you're taking notes, that's the sermon points today. Uh, Brother, Brother Monty, what time is it? Oh, praise God. Because <laughs> I got three points, and I'm just now to the introduction. All right, three results... Of, of failing to surrender or submit to the authority of God. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. Let me briefly catch you up. If you haven't been here, let me catch you up to where we are. Uh, the, the Hebrews have been in Egypt, okay, for 400 years, and there they have found themselves now a, a twist and turn in, in the direction of their lives, and now they find themselves under the uh, as bond servants of the Egyptians, and they're being oppressed by an evil dictator, an evil uh, Pharaoh king, and, and he doesn't like the Hebrews. He's worried about that they're a threat to his kingdom and a threat to his throne, so he's doing everything he can to destroy the people of God. But God, come on, let me tell you, mm, I got like 20, sir. I didn't get to preach last week, and I'm telling you, I got like 20 going off in my head right now. I'm liable to preach them all. Here's the deal. We find, we, 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 we find that God is moving behind the scenes. We saw last week as God is preparing to take care of his people. His word says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. I want you to know God has always uh, got everything under control. He's always got things moving, and he's moving behind the scenes, and he's preparing someone to come and take care of his people and lead them to victory. But some things take place. While we're getting there, we learned last week that Moses is 
as God was moving behind the scenes and he was kind of preparing. Pharaoh had, had, had made an edict that, that all the Hebrew boys, and then later not only all the Hebrew, but all the boys in all the land of Egypt are to be killed. But God, and only the way that God can do it, he's got some strange ways about him, but God protected this one Hebrew baby named Moses and he was going to set him apart to do something magnificent. He's got a plan and a purpose for Moses. Can I just tell you, he's got a plan and a purpose purpose for your life too we need to understand that he's always moving behind the scenes working things out we know that Moses was picked up in a basket by the night in the Nile River and he was picked up by Pharaoh's daughter so he came and he was raised by the one who was charged to kill him but that's how God works here we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 2 about 40 years later now Moses is a grown man and the plan of God begins to unfold and come into fruition but we're going to see as it comes in into fruition how Moses messed it up Exodus chapter 2 beginning in verse 11 the Bible says now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew one of his brethren so he looked this way and he looked that way and when he saw that there was no one around, he murdered him. He struck him down and killed him. And then he hid his body, his dead body, in the sand. In verse 13, he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? And he said, Who made you the prince or judge or deliverer of us? Boy, he didn't know he was a prophet, did he? Are you intended to kill us as you did the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, oh, no. <laughs> Boy, everybody knows about this thing now. Verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Bidian. And there he sat down by a well. Three results of failing to surrender or submit to God's authority in our life. Can I tell you that we've got to look to God for everything? Come on, look at me. If you don't get anything else, everybody look up here. We have to surrender our lives, and, and we've got to look to God for everything. We ought to pray about everything. Our lives ought to be spent working things out in the heavenlies through our prayer and through God's uh, answer in, in, into our lives. We ought to be discerning the Spirit of God and figuring out how and when and where and what God wants us to do at all times. Mm. We're going to see what happens when we don't. The first result of failing to submit to God's authority is the fact that we, when we fail to submit to God's authority, we're going to step out of bounds. We're going to step out of bounds. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and, and there he looked on their hard labors and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and he looked that way and when he saw nobody was looking and nobody was around, he did what he wanted to do. And he killed that old Egyptian and then hid his body in the sand. Can I tell you that when we fail to look to God for the source uh, of the authority in our life and we fail to look for God and the answers and the answers for what he wants us to do and how he wants us to do it, we'll wind up like Moses and we'll be stepping out of bounds. You want me to tell you, stepping out of bounds, I'm just getting politically correct, ain't I? I went to booger to ain't. I am killing the English teachers in here. But here's the deal. You know, that's politically correct. You know what Moses did? He sinned. He sinned. He stepped out of the boundaries that God has for his life. We know that Moses, I just told you that Moses was brought up in the, in the house of Pharaoh. God had an alternate plan for Moses. And as we'll see it unfold in the next few weeks, uh, we're going we're gonna to see and understand that, that God's plan for Moses was to deliver the people of, of Israel, his people, from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. He was going to be the rescuer of the Hebrews. Now, here's the thing. 
I want you to walk with me for just a minute, okay? I'm just getting down here. I'm getting on teaching level because I'm getting ready to rock your theology. You ready? Because God rocked my theology this week. Uh, how many of you have ever heard the story of Moses before? How many of you have ever seen Prince of Egypt? Okay, all right, two of you. But I mean, when we hear and tell the story, most of us have. If you haven't heard this story before, then just hang tight, okay? Because I'm going somewhere with this. It's important. But, but for those of us, most of us have heard the story and how, and, and, and we hear the story and we tell the story kind of like this. We believe that Moses uh, was called to be the, the deliverer of the, uh, of the Israelites out of Egypt and that God, listen, God had to send him out to the desert and get him trained up. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Don't we tell this in Sunday school? And that God sent him out there and, and got him all learned up and trained up exactly how he wanted to do it. And then he sent him back 40 years later. He sent him back in order to come and deliver the Israelites. And man, they just went and walked through the wall of water on the left and wall of water on the right. And I mean, it just, oh, we just tell that magnificent story. But can I share with you something that, that God showed me this week? Listen, come back. You got to walk with me here. Get up here so you can see me. Here, here's the deal. I don't think that that's how it happened. I don't think. Walk with me. I don't. I, I don't believe in my study and, and and the terms that I've come to in this story. I don't believe that it was ever God's will for Moses to go to the desert and get trained up. I don't believe it was ever God's will for his people to suffer for 40 more years. I believe all that transpired because Moses boogered it up. I believe right here in, in Exodus chapter 2 is when God begins to unfold the very plan. And I believe the very reason why Moses went to the, to the Israelites and why he, uh, uh, why, why he visited his brethren was to go and initiate this plan to pull, them out of, uh, to pull them out of Egypt. I believe it was supposed to start right then. You say, Pastor, how do you get that? Well, I'm glad you asked. In my study, and I was studying this extensively, and, and I'm telling y'all, it rocked my theology because I've been telling the same story too, the same way. But, I don't, but God showed me something different in this. Over in Acts chapter 7, in verse 23, we studied the book of Acts. And, and y'all remember Stephen, he was one of the first deacons. And, and, and he got to laying out on a sermon to the Pharisees. And I mean, he was throwing down the gospel. And, I mean, he started right where they, they needed him to start. I mean, he started at Abraham and made a beeline for the cross at Calvary. Amen? That's a whole nother sermon. But I think every sermon ought to start somewhere and make a beeline for the cross at Calvary. But that's what Stephen did right before. I mean, he was throwing down and he was preaching right before they killed him. Y'all are a little bit better to the preachers today than they were. But he did, and he laid out. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 23, he comes to this account that we see in Exodus chapter 2. And you know what the Bible says? Here's what it says. In Acts chapter 7, verse 23, Stephen's account of, of Moses' uh, of Moses's plan, or God's plan for Moses. The Bible says, but when he was approaching the age of 40, he's talking about Exodus chapter 2 right now, okay, not later. Not, not the age of 80, but the age of 40. It entered into Moses' mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. See, when we read this in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, it seems like an arbitrary visit. Like, like he just decided one day just to go down there and check on the Hebrews and see how they're doing. But when we see Stephen's account, we begin to understand it's a little bit deeper. That the Bible says it entered into his mind. When you look at the original language and, 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 and how it's written in the Greek, literally that verse translates, it welled up in his heart. It welled up in his heart. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe this is when God had sent Moses down at the age of 40. He sent him down there to enact the very plan to deliver his people and take them back to the promised land and, and, and to bring them out from the oppression and the rule of an evil dictator who was, who was punishing and looking to destroy the people of God. God sent a deliverer in there. But here's the thing. We look at Moses. A couple of good things. One, 
God sent him. I believe that. And he went. It's important that we go. I believe, mm, I believe Moses' heart was right. God sent him, and he was willing. You've got to remember, he was raised as a prince of Egypt. He was raised as Pharaoh's grandson. For him to step out and go talk to those Hebrews, he was putting everything on the line. I believe he was wholeheartedly following God. But when he got down there, you know what happened? He got down there under the plan and the provision and the calling of God, but when he got there, he forgot to ask God what to do. Y'all didn't catch that. He forgot to ask God what to do. God sent him to deliver his people, and when he got there, he forgot to ask God how. And when you fail to look at God and 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 use the authority of God as the source of your life. We've got to look to God for everything because if not, guess what happens? We booger it up! I just love that word. He messed it up! He got down there and nowhere. The Bible says that he looked, he saw the oppression of his people. He saw the very people that he was called to deliver. He was willing to go down there. And then all of a sudden when he got down there, he saw one of, one of them old Egyptians beating up one of his Hebrew brethren and made him mad. And he got his mind all messed up. So what did he do? Nowhere in here does it say, well, God, what do you want me to do? Nowhere in here does it, does it say that Moses took the opportunity to pray and seek God. He's down there on God's mission, but he never looked to God. He never said, God, what do you want me to do? I'm down here. they beating up your folks down here. What do you want me to do? You want me to whoop somebody? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to do this, God? I'm down here and things are going awry. I'm down here. I'm, I'm seeing the action. I'm seeing what's going on, and it ain't good. God, what do you want me to do? Don't you know this is how we got to operate in our life? I mean, because the bottom coming out, he's done. Nowhere did he ever look to God. Nowhere. You know what he did? He got down there, and he wasn't worried about what God wanted him to do. He was mad. But you know what he did? He did like Aaron. Y'all know. I'm full of energy today. I'm running in here as fast as I was from that cop car. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he did like Aaron. And he went and he did what he wanted. Not what God wanted. What he wanted. Can I just tell you that when we operate in what we want to do and we fail to look to God, we will mess it all up. And we'll forfeit whatever God wants to do in our life. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe it was God's will for him to be having to go to the desert and flee Egypt and flee the people of God. I believe God called him to be the deliverer. And he went down there and he acted in his own power and his own authority and he messed it all up. And he forfeited the blessing and favor of God on his life. He forfeited the blessing and favor of the mission of God. And not only did he suffer here, let me give you, let me, let, you need to write this down. Not only did Moses suffer as a result of him stepping out of bounds or his sin because he failed to look for God, the whole people of God. They had to be oppressed and they had to be under the rule and, and, and people died and people were beaten and people were mistreated as a result of Moses failing to look for God to be the source of the authority of his life. Moses had a good heart. He was right on track with God, was he not? Doesn't this tell us something? Doesn't this remind us that it doesn't matter how good you are and how good you're trying to be? One second, listen, one second outside the will of God and you're capable of anything. Moses murdered a man. He killed him in cold blood and stepped outside the boundaries and authority of the Word of God and the boundaries that God has set for our life. Murder is a sin. 
And as a result of the sin, it forfeited what God was going to use most of the time. Jesus Christ. I'll give you a preview to the end of the story. I may not make it there this morning, probably not, but let me tell you what we're going to talk about tonight. He'll give you another chance. But do you really want to wait 40 years for another chance? I mean, come on, most of us in here don't have 40 years left. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. We've got to get it going now. And we've got to understand that we as individuals must submit to the authority of God and look to God as the source of the answers and the source of everything that we have at every moment of our life. And what we are all, listen, I don't care who you are. I don't care how good you are. I don't care what track you're on. You may be, I mean, you may just be polishing up. You are, you are 2013. You're on your, you're on your New Year's resolution. You're reading your Bible every day. You're praying every day. You've been to church every time the doors are open. Praise God. But let me tell you something. Every single one of us in this place including and especially the preacher, is one step away from speaking the truth. We're one step away from doing something that will absolutely destroy the plan that God has and the way that he wants to carry it out for you. We're one step away, just like Moses was. We have got to submit to the authority of God in our lives. You know, I was thinking about this. Got a few minutes. I was thinking about this and how not only does it affect our individual lives, guess what? It affects our corporate lives as a church. Did you did you know that? Think about this. We have to submit to the authority of God, and if we don't in our individual lives, we will booger things up. I just I, I love that word. Your kids and grandkids going to go home and say, well, the preacher's talking about boogers all day. <clears throat> We're going to mess it up, but here's the deal. We as a church have to follow the same plan. Do you know, maybe you hadn't realized it, maybe you're a guest here, but for those of us who've been here for the last four and a half years, I'm telling you, God is doing something amazing in the life of this church. Things that, I mean, I, I've never even heard of before. I mean, we've seen people get saved. We've seen people, I've seen people get baptized in their clothes. I've seen people get saved in the offertory. Now, you know somebody's going to heaven when they get saved in the offertory. We're taking up money. I mean, I've seen amazing things, and you have too. You've experienced the power of God on our church, and, and he's got a plan. Just like he had a plan for Moses, and he's got a plan for your life, he's got a plan for our our corporate life as a church and I was thinking about this this morning and how imperative it is that, that I as your pastor and, and, and the leadership that you've elected and employed in the life of our church that, that, that we keep our focus on Jesus and it's not easy to do in the church you say pastor what do you mean let me tell you something there are all kind of distractions here there are all kind of things that want to pull us away from looking to God to be the source of everything. God has blessed our church. Four and a half years, more than 500 people have come to be a part of Grace Baptist. 237 through the waters of baptism. Y'all, yeah. <clears throat> people getting saved and their lives changed by the power of God. Not anything we're doing, but what God is doing in us. But listen. As much as God is working, and I believe it's absolute, listen, I believe it's absolutely as a result of your leadership of your church that you've employed being on their faces before God. And I, as your pastor, listen, I'm not perfect, but I'm telling you, I'm looking to God for everything. And, and when we mess up, listen, if we mess up, it's an exception rather than the rule. I'm telling you, we are looking to God, and, he, and that's the results that have ensued from that. But as quickly as it's come is as quickly as we can lose it because even as a church, we're one step away from speaking the truth. We're one step away from taking our eyes off Jesus 
for one moment. And that's why I, as your pastor, the one that God has called to shepherd and to lead you and to, and, and to equip you for the, for, for, the, for the work of ministry and to go out and for us to accomplish what God has in, in store for not only our individual lives but our lives as a whole. And that's why I'm so, I take this thing so serious. That's why I'm on my face every day before God, asking him about you, asking him about me. What do you want us to do? How do you want us to do it? And I'm doing my best to lead us in the direction that God is leading us as we go. In the plan that he wants to accomplish. Because, folks, I don't want us to step out of bounds. And let me tell you something, it's hard. Can I tell you it's hard? It's not, it's not easy going God's way. You're going to find in your individual lives, it's not easy going God's way. It's much easier to do what Moses did and take things into your own hands. It's not easy as a pastor to lead us in the direction that God wants to go because not everybody wants to go. Come on, not everybody wants to go in God's direction. But that's why I rely leadership and, and, and I rely on the Holy Spirit of God to give us direction and that's why here at Grace Baptist we don't lead by opinion polls and suggestion boxes. That's why here at Grace Baptist we lead under the authority and the provision and the power of the Holy Spirit of God to lead our, our direction and to guide us to where God is leading us to go to, to change lives and to be the light for the world that he's called us to be. Folks as easy as it comes easy as it goes. We've got, we've got to get this. Everything is about submitting to God's authority. And if you're here today, listen, I'll say, I'll say this in closing. I'm not going to get to the other two points. Come back tonight. Maybe I'll get to one more. But I think about this. It's all about God and God's authority in our life. And it's all about first submitting to God and giving our lives over to Him. I go back to what I said in the beginning. You may be here and you may be lost and you may have never given your life to Jesus and you may have thought about this dictatorship thing that the preacher said and, and, and how God, how we lose the rights to our life and, and how we can no longer make our own decisions. And, and, and you may be thinking about that and you say, well, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I make my own decisions now. Come on, walk with me. You may be here and say, well, I'll make my own decisions now, and, and I do my own thing. I ain't got nobody telling me what to do. How's that going for you? I mean, for real. We all rebel against authority. I told you, everybody in here, out of everybody in here, 100% of us don't want God to tell us what to do either, whether we're his child or not. But that's the reason why most Christians and most people just live with the bottom of, the, of their life coming out all the time. They live such broken lives. Their bank accounts are broken. Their marriages are broken. Their relationships are broken because they want to do things in their own power, in their own way. I'm telling you, there's a better way. Wake up. I'm telling you, there's a better way. There is. I'm telling you. I've tried for 20 years to do things my own way. And I'm telling you, it just led me to brokenness. Until I realized one day how broken I was and I gave my life over to Jesus. And no, I hadn't wanted to do everything that Jesus told me to do. He called me to be a preacher. You think I wanted to be a preacher? I told you last week, you're weird. I don't want to be one. No, my life has never been the same. What about you? Today is a day of change. What do you want to do with your life today? How do you want to do it? The first day and the rest of your life is right here. What decision will you make? If you want to give your life to Jesus today, then try it. Listen, trying it can't be any worse. If you don't trust me, trust him and just get just just step in there and just see if it's any better. I promise you it will be. Take that step. What about you, Christian? Are you sold out? Is Jesus the Lord of your life and the Savior of your life? See, most of us just want Jesus to be the Savior, but we want to be the Lord. Is he the Lord of your life today? Will you submit to his authority?
choice is yours. He's already made for you. Father, help us. Speak to us. Redeem us today. In Jesus' name. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. Sing with integrity the words of this song that I am redeemed. Today can be the first day in the rest of your life. You can shake off these heavy chains can be everything that God wants you to be if you're willing to submit to Him today. If you're willing to call on Him to be the Lord of your life. If you're here and never been saved, now's the opportunity to do that. If you're here today and you're a Christian and you've never really submit, surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus, today is the day. Maybe you need to serve Him. Maybe, maybe you're not a member of the church or maybe you've never been baptized or maybe there's an aspect of your life that the authority of God is missing from. Today, let it be I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Encouragers, come. Make your way forward. If there's any decisions, as we sing this song together, I want you to come. Encouragers, you come. Come, come.
thank you that we're redeemed by the power of your blood. Redeemed by the power of the cross of Calvary. And Father, you said that we'll confess our sin, that you're faithful and righteous and just to forgive us our sin. And Father, that coincides with redemption. And we thank you for that. Father, thank you for the decisions that have been made today. Thank you, Father, for the hearts that have been changed today by the power of your word. And Lord, I pray now as we prepare for a time of worship and we take up your tithe and, and Father, the offering above the tithe, Lord, maybe this is an area of our life that we have not submitted to your authority. And God, we're, we need help. Father, today I pray if there be anyone here that, that Father, hasn't submitted to the understanding of that it all belongs to you. Lord, you give in proportion to how we give. You said he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And we know, Father, that that's the understanding of, of us just being obedient to you. We understand that, that our obedience is equivalent to your blessing and favor in our life. So, Lord, I pray today if there's anyone that's bound up in the shackles and the chains of the enemy and oppressed by him by not believing the tithe and believing the offering above the tithe. Father, let it be set free today. Let somebody get saved as a result of the tithe and the offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. of Jesus that's our victory and as we close out today Brother Monty or Brother Johnny one of them is going to come and close us but I won't take the privilege we have to introduce to you our newest members of Grace Baptist Church praise God <clears throat> this is this is Annette and Luke and Kelsey and they're part of all part of the Shrum clan I just call them the Shrum clan amen but they uh, have come to you night with us. This is where God wants them to serve. They've been coming for a long time. Praise God. I kept telling them the water's fine. Get on in here, Mr. Chester. I mean, just get in here. But they're here. Are you excited about that decision today? Yeah. God has been good to us. And, and through Jesus, we have the victory. On your way out today, I want you to love them. Now, we're going to get you a picture and all that. Are y'all are y'all dolled up? Luke? You going to get your picture made in that, son? Okay, good, good. 
Uh, y'all go back there. Y'all see John Daniel and those doors, and uh, we're going to come and take your picture. John Daniel, if you get them doors open for him back there, and Brother Monty, you come. Hadn't it been a good day, day today? Something like that. I think what he said, amen? It has been a wonderful day in the Lord, and hasn't he just greatly blessed us? We're so thankful for our visitors who are with us this morning. Of course, Brother Steve wants to spend some time with you, so take your car and go see him, and he has his...